All right, so welcome back everybody to the monthly AVH webinars. And Susan Beal is going to put tonight's topic into context for everyone. Well, we, we, we were just saying that uh, this, uh, this whole webinar season has been uh, a little bit um, shifted by the global events and pandemic stuff and we spent some time earlier in the year just having some extemporaneous discussion about what what was happening when when the pandemic um uh the sars cov 2 pandemic uh, just first arrived and how think people were dealing with things and what we as the homeopathic community might have to offer and uh have continue that discussion off and on. We've also punctuated uh, the, the, the time uh, talking a little bit about sort of um, terrain, uh, susceptibility of individuals to certain states, uh, looking at other larger uh, obstacles, stuff that we as homeopaths talk about, obstacles to cure, and, and also obstacles to the clear expression of the, of the, of the individual's case. And uh, kind of following along in that uh, our colleague Todd Cooney from uh, Kokomo is going to talk about uh, pandemics and genus epidemicus um, from the perspective of parvo uh, and parvovirus in dogs and I'll uh, I'll let Todd uh, I'm sure you can do a better job of introducing yourself <laughs> than I can I could tell <laughs> tales and, and stuff but um, <laughs> But uh, if you want to add anything else about that, we, we certainly, you know, know, know Todd by his, uh, by his uh, long history of good scholarship in homeopathy and, and, his, uh, and his practice in Kokomo there, that's uh, the homeopathic practice there. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot, Susan. And thanks, Jeff. Um, glad to be here with everybody. And... Um, um, I hope this title doesn't turn anybody off right away. Like, oh no, we're going to talk about Parvo, but um, we're going to have a larger perspective, I think, in dealing with, like Susan said, everything that's been happening globally and certainly in our country. You know, dealing with with COVID nineteen and and um, you can't find a person on the street anymore that isn't familiar with the word pandemic right now. It seems like so. Um, um, and I do practice in northern Indiana, still Kokomo. I'm about halfway between Chicago and Indianapolis. <clears throat> and um, what what I've had the good fortune of doing is uh, the last 10 years or so is using my small animal, mostly small animal practice, as kind of a laboratory to to try out um, different things with homeopathy and especially with a preventive from a preventive medicine standpoint. And so. I'll I'll just go into this and it'll be self-explanatory as we start along here. So these um, these puppies on the cover photo are actually from a C-section we did earlier this year. So they these are original photos from the clinic. A lot of them. So um, I think our objective here will be just reviewing epidemic epidemic diseases in animals with a focus on parvo, canine parvo, and then talking about the homeopathic approach to parvo cases applying the concept of genus epidemicus to parvo. And we're going to get into some talk about nosodes as well, which I know can sometimes be a little controversial, but we'll we'll get into what my experience has been. So um, we won't dwell too much on the review material, but everyone knows canine parvovirus is, is the most common viral disease of pups in the USA, uh, possibly worldwide. There was a sudden appearance of this disease back in the late 1970s, but it's still common today. And it strikes fear into puppy owners. New, new, new puppy owners or puppy parents will definitely be familiar with parvo even if they've never experienced it. And their primary focus is to prevent this problem. Um, I'll just say right from the get-go here that I haven't vaccinated a pup for parvo in over 10 years. And I use homeopathy to prevent and treat all cases, and I have great results. Um, not boasting, I'm just stating facts. We have great results. So, and I give all the credit to homeopathy, really. So, one thing that was peculiar about Parvo was the sudden emergence, how it just seemed to come out of nowhere in a short time frame, causing acute GI illness in pups, about six to 20 weeks old mainly, and uh, rarely a fatal myocarditis in neonatal pups. 
CPV2 first appeared in Europe in 1976. By 1978, it was a worldwide um, pandemic. It also occurs in wild species, um, both canine and feline, and mustelids and bears and other animals. It's related to the feline panleukopenia virus, and a lot of uh, people think it likely arose from two or three mutations of feline panleukopenia virus. That's a whole topic in itself, but we're not going to go into that too much, but it's interesting to follow that thread for a while. <clears throat> So uh, Cornell scientists first isolated canine parvovirus in late 1978. And by 1979, they developed the first vaccine and an approved attenuated vaccine in 1981. Uh, Cornell's Baker Institute says canine parvovirus has decreased due to decades of vaccination, but, but outbreaks still occur and it's still a common problem in a lot of practice areas. They state on their website that vaccinating dogs is of utmost importance, but I question this, is it really? And we're gonna go into that. Another statement they make that I, I can get behind is that dogs that recover from canine parvovirus infection retain lifelong protective immunity against that strain that infected them. And this is true with many viruses and actually bacteria, you know, with lepto, this is true. They, they usually have lifelong immunity from the strain that infected them. So, <clears throat> um, excuse me, I really began to question the wisdom of vaccines back in the 1990s, and this was before I took the homeopathy class, but, you know, we were dealing with things like fibrosarcomas in cats, acute hemolytic anemia in dogs, where there was definite vaccine links in both of those situations. And then in, in the late 90s, the Purdue vaccine study was published, which showed that there is a 100% a, a autoimmunity in vaccinated dogs compared to 0% in unvaccinated dogs. That's my kind of statistics there. You don't need a statistician to tell you if that's significant or not, 100 to zero. So, you know, I took all this in and information and really felt driven to find a better way in my own practice life. But, but what would it be? What could I do? How could I practice without vaccines? So I felt like this guy over here pushing this huge boulder felt like a large weight. So then when, um, then when I, <clears throat> sorry, Jeff, I'm gonna do that just for a second so I can get rid of this window here, I can't. There we go, okay, sorry about that. Um, so in 2008, um, my searching led me to take the homeopathy course with Dr. Pitcairn, and I really began to adjust my thinking and approach to vaccination. and. Um, Toward the end of the homeopathy course, I started to decrease doses of DHPP vaccine from three to two to one in 2008 to none by 2010. So by the end of the homeopathy course, I wasn't giving any DHPP vaccine at all to puppies. But I wasn't really using nosodes either. I, I just wasn't doing much. I was supporting them with um, supplements and using some remedies. And uh, even today, we don't use any conventional vaccines at all in the practice, except rabies, and only if they're healthy, if the animal's healthy. If they're not healthy, they don't get a rabies vaccine, they get a waiver and um, a remedy. And uh, also, if the client requests no rabies vaccine, we'll, we'll honor their request. You know, we're not gonna force them into that. So, um, conventional wisdom says, you know, no matter which reference you look at, if you look at any reference uh, of conventional advice, it says vaccinate early and often to stay ahead of parvo. But I, I would say, is this really the best option? My experience says clearly otherwise. So when I stopped vaccinating in 2010, and parvo is now less a concern than ever in over 30 years of practice. I mean, just to put it in perspective, I well, I got out of vet school in 86. And I've been doing mostly small animal practice since about 93. And most mornings walking into the practice, I was greeted with the aroma of Parvo. You know, it was like we had a Parvo air freshener in the clinic or something. That, that smell would greet you first thing in the morning. And um, because we always had a, a sick puppy in the hospital, at least one, it seemed like. 
So when I began to go away from vaccinations, um, I, I got a lot of pushback from other vets in my area. There's about six of the clinics nearby in our community, and they were not happy that I was not vaccinating for Parvo. And they would just tell our clients point blank, you know, get a shot, that homeopathic stuff doesn't work. So um, I've, I've had to do a lot of educating, had to educate clients, and sometimes it's a very easy task, other times it's a little, little more involved. But we, we really just discuss the realities of vaccination and immunity, which, which aren't the same. I point that out to them, but that they aren't equal. And how strong immunity develops without shots. Stronger, stronger immunity, I would say, compared to vaccinated puppies. So as people go down that path and they, they use homeopathy and they see their pups doing well, uh, a lot of times this is their first encounter with homeopathy. And so their confidence confidence in homeopathy grows and their fear of parvo shrinks. So all of a sudden they're up to a one-year-old puppy that's healthy and hasn't had any issues or maybe had a short brush with parvo and survived it. So one of the things I like best about this approach is that I, I, I no more have to deal with anaphylaxis hives swollen faces, vomiting, diarrhea, and the occasional death of puppies that come in and get vaccinated. So, and also pups don't get a jab, a needle jab on their first visit to the clinic. And you've all heard of the Fear Free initiative, I'm sure Dr. Marty Becker with um, Fear Free, the whole concept of trying to make your practice more animal friendly and people friendly. Um, nothing does that better than not having to inject a puppy on its first visit or its first three or four visits actually. So, so this is something I think that if it were embraced by the conventional world, it would really be phenomenal, you know, but we have ways to go before we can do that. So I'll, I'm gonna go over briefly just what we do, what we do in our practice for parvo um, homeoprophylaxis. And we have a, what we call a puppy wellness package. We also have a kitten wellness package because we mainly see dogs and cats in the practice. We see some exotics too, but we don't really have young animal wellness packages for them. So um, the most common one that we do is the puppy wellness package. <clears throat> and um, we use no sods instead of vaccines for everything except for rabies. And uh, no sods, as, you, as you're probably aware, they're, they're remedies, homeopathic remedies, made from products of disease. And they have a long history of providing protection especially given close to the time of exposure. And that's that's the real key, that's the trick, is giving it close to the time of exposure. And um, as you can see on the little vial of parvovirus in the bottom right, the top of the bottle says Hahnemann Laboratories. And uh, that I know so kit there. And I bought this at the AVH meeting, I think in Savannah, Georgia, back, back in, I don't know, 2009 or somewhere around there. But they, they had a vendor booth set up and I, I bought this kit and I love it, I still have it. I've only had to reorder vials a few times. So this is the uh, Hahnemann Labs, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the source where I get no suits from. There are other sources as well. I've just always used Hahnemann Labs. I've been very happy with uh, the no suits I get from them. So as I started doing this with, with puppies and, you know, I had a little bit of um, trepidation. I I wasn't totally sure that I was on the right path. I, I wondered how things were going. So I, I thought, well, I'll look at some data from my practice. And this was uh, the practice I'm in now, we started from scratch in 2012. So about 2013, the end of that year, I think I started to mine some data out of our records. And um, I, did a, I did a retrospective study of parvo cases in our clinic. And like I said, uh, no sods are most effective given close to likely exposure. So it's a timing thing. And with puppies, who you know, who knows when they're gonna get exposed to parvo, we don't really know for sure. The uh, potency of the no sod is, is up for debate a lot of times. Um, a lot of references will say to use 30C or, or lower. Um, I usually use 200C and I'll use 30C if I, if I think it's a weaker, a weaker life force but I've, I've been pretty consistent with 200C. So what I did at this time frame, I looked back 18 months in my clinic through the records, and we just focused on all the parvo-positive cases, including 
those that had no sods. So this included no sods and non no sod puppies. So I was just curious to see how things were going. And I, I presented this first at the ranch meeting, I think in 2014, the spring of 2014. And then um, I took that information and, and wrote it up in Dogs and Aftery magazine in 2014. I think it was July, August issue. But so the, the you know, the bottom line of what I found out, there, there were, um, it's a little small print here, but it was, it was a small case number size, but um, 19 of 47 pups were vaccinated and still got parvo, which was 40%. And um, puppies receiving the no sods only that got sick had a 0% mortality rate compared to vaccinated pups who had a 76% mortality rate. So vaccinated pups did much worse as far as surviving compared to no sod puppies. And then we had pups that had a combination, they'd received vaccines and no sods, and they had mortality rate that was, I think, around 35%, so it was somewhere between there. But the, the big thing I got from that was it gave me confidence that no sods were, were helpful. And so this helped me um, talk to skeptical pup parents about skipping shots. So with no sods, excellent nutrition supplements, we can optimize the pup's immunity um, or their terrain, you could say, to not only parvo, but other challenges it will face. And one thing I, I've always noticed is that pups who survive parvo without vaccines become some of the healthiest dogs I've ever seen in over 30 years of practice. It's like nothing can, can stop, nothing gets to these dogs. I mean, they don't tend to have any issues. They might break a leg or something once in a while, but they, they don't have chronic disease problems very much. So just, just a quick aside, uh, as far as no-sodes, Christopher Day, the British homeopath, he did a famous study with kennel cough no-sode in a large dog shelter in the 70s. And this, is, this information is published in his book that's shown in the picture here. So the, the large purple bars are the uh, percent of dogs that had kennel cough before no-sodes were used. So it's approaching 100% in the vaccinated dogs, and it's approaching 90% in the unvaccinated. And then after they started adding, all they did was add kennel cough no so to the drinking water. And you can see the vaccinated and unvaccinated population both went down considerably close to zero. So it was a very dramatic result with kennel cough no so. And I've seen the same thing in my practice. We don't use kennel cough vaccine. We just use the no so, and we, we never see kennel cough anymore. We just don't, unless it's a dog that came in from outside the practice and got vaccinated somewhere else. So another thing shelters could really benefit from, I think, is just getting on board and at least trying kennel cough no So, um, so then this um, uh, this past year or so, I decided to do a second study and look at a bigger time frame in our practice. So. Just to put things in perspective, this practice uh, pictured here, uh, pic uh, my granddaughter calls it the sunshine house because our logo is a sunshine, so it's a sunshine house. And uh, we started in February 2012 and we're up to over 10,000 clients and over 21,000 patients right now. And over, just to give you a size of the scale of the operation, so I did a six year study period I took from January 1st, 2014 to January 1st, 2020, so six years. And during that time, we saw over 54,000 appointments, averaging about 174 a week. And also, I just wanted to look at no sods. So we did 651 puppy wellness packages and an additional 918 parva no sods for 1,569 pups altogether. And the additional parva no sods are people who come in and they sometimes they don't want to purchase the entire puppy wellness package. They don't want all that. They just want the parvonosa because they've heard about it from other people, word of mouth. They just want to protect their pup from parvo. You know, and we have, you know, like other places in in the in the country, um, the economy has hit people hard, and so we have people that sometimes have limited means. So they just want to do parvonosa. So, but the bottom line is we had 1,569 pups to work with who had parvonosa. Uh, given to them. 
One thing that changed, um, and you'll see this in a second here. Um, so during the six years, those six years, we had 133 pups test positive for parvo, 104 test negative. So, so we're going to focus on the positive cases, the 133 positive. Of those puppies, 51 of them had no sods, 43 lived and eight died, which is about almost 19%. 82 had no no sods and 66 lived and 16 died. Or 24%. So that doesn't sound that doesn't sound too impressive there, as far as statistically different. But one thing I want to uh, point out is that all eight of the deaths occurred prior to January 2016, when we changed our no so no protocol. Before that, we were giving no sods just once a month for three total doses, because I I, I didn't really know how to dose the no sods. I was going by what other folks had done and tried. And so I was just using this kind of trial and error. So we were doing monthly for three doses, similar to how you would dose a vaccine. And after January 2016, we switched to once weekly until six months old. And so all the deaths occurred prior to switching to the weekly NOSO administration. I think that is significant. So, and then down in the blue, you see that since going to weekly dosing, we've only had five cases of Parvo. And four of those were in 2016 during kind of the transitional year. And all five of these survived with homeopathy, uh, homeopathic treatment, um, and maybe fluid therapy, depending on their on their condition. So I, I found from that that no so protocol does matter, at least in our practice situation, it, it made a big difference. Because before changing to the weekly no sub dosing, in 2016, we another way to look at the data, we had 46 positive pups out of 686 total, or 6.7%. And all eight of the deaths, like I said, all eight of the deaths occurred then. So eight out of 46 pups is 17% mortality. So, you know, and that was higher than I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be closer to zero. So when we started in 2016 and weekly dosing, we, from that point on, we had only five positives pups out of 883 total for 0.6% um, incidence and zero deaths, so zero deaths. So I think it's pretty plain to see that that result is a lot better than before the weekly dosing started. It's one of my favorite dogs, a little Irish terrier that comes in, very sweet. So, um, so with no sods, and I know no sods can be controversial, and there's a lot of, um, well, there's not a lot of information about no sods, really. There have been a few studies done showing that they don't stimulate antibody production, but um, I would argue that antibody production is not necessary for immunity, and there are some interesting studies out there with measles showing that that's the case. You know, people with no antibodies have been immune, found immune to it, and others with antibodies got measles. So. You know, antibodies are not the main source of immunity, I don't think. So I don't think that can be a good measure of immunity when it comes to no sods. So um, as far as treating parvo, if it does occur, polycrest remedies tend to be the most useful as far as my experience goes. Hahnemann says there are a few remedies, the majority of whose symptoms correspond in similarity with the symptoms of the commonest and most frequent of human diseases or animal diseases, and hence very often find and efficacious homeopathic employment. They may be termed polycrests. So by choosing the most characteristic symptoms of canine parvovice, we can find a small group of helpful remedies and maybe even find a genus septimicus, which would be really nice. So these are some graphs I made for the ranch meeting back in 2014, and I, I haven't really modified them. I think it still stands. So at first I just took a small, I took four rubrics, stool, odor, offensive, stool, watery, generalities, weakness, diarrhea from, and then a concomitant nausea and vomiting with diarrhea. And uh, listing all remedies, arsenicum, ipecac, phosphorus, veratrum, vilcamara. You can see the, the listing here. So arsenicum and the other two, other three really tied for second. When I add more symptoms and make a larger analysis, it's interesting, the first two stay the same, arsenicum and ipecac stay the same. And so arsenicum is in the highest position in both graphs. 
One thing I found just from you know clinical standpoint is that Mexvomic is really useful in early stages, even though it doesn't show pi in this graph. But it 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 has a grade four for vomiting, um, grade four for diarrhea, and a grade four for bloody stool. So those are like nitty gritty symptoms of parvo. So you could say it's high grade for all those. Um, but other remedies are too. Mercurius is the same way, and arsenicum, of course. So if we limit the selection of remedies just to the antisoric remedies, and I did this on uh, the New World Repertory, uh, uh, Dr. Pitcairn's repertory. So I used the same four rubrics as the first one, and it changes the order of things a little bit. We get arsenicum, phosphorus, docomara, colosynthus. So arsenicum and phosphorus are the highest ranking, and I find that phosphorus is is often pretty helpful toward the end of the illness, especially if they start to have really bright red blood in the stool. And um, so I don't often give it early on, but I arsenicum is many times or nux vomic are my go-to remedies early on, depending on how the the animal looks. So if we use the larger rubric list too. We can see that some other um, other good antisoric remedies are showing up now. Arsenicum is still in first place; it's still high in first position. But sulfur, mercurius, silica, belladonna, carboveg, and I think these, you know, would be helpful to make note of for this pup for later on if something happens or the case gets stuck. Um, some cases I've had that seem to be stuck toward the end of their illness, and I would just give sulfur, and they just snap out of it. And um, or, or Mercurius, something like that. So, and this could also be helpful, you know, to consider the pup's uh, chronic disease remedy as they get old. So, uh, aphorism 73 says, since every case of disease in a Giffen epidemic has the same origin, the disease puts all those who've fallen ill into the same kind of disease process. And, Again, in 241, if the character of the epidemic disease is discovered according to the symptom complex common to all the patients, i.e. the genus epidemicus, this will point to the homeopathically fitting or specific remedy for the totality of the cases. So this is, in a sense, what we've done by listing these parvo symptoms, ranking these remedies. We're looking for what could be considered um, the genus epidemicus, the homeopathic fitting remedy for the totality of cases. Uh, genus epidemicus, um, of course, got a lot of attention earlier this year. And um, many of you probably saw Will Falconer's post about having COVID-19 and he, he worked with Richard and other homeopaths and got back on track pretty quick with homeopathy. So you still will consider the totality of characteristic symptoms for many cases. Find the best matching remedies and then individualize and use this remedy for both prevention and treatment. It can work for either. So healthy folks that don't have it yet can be protected by the genus epidemicus. That's that's the theory. And then this was from Richard's post back in March of this year where he uh, posted his graph, um, his findings, which show his um, show his rationale behind choosing Nux vomica as the best remedy for genus epidemicus early on in the disease. And, and um, this was proved out over and over again in many, many people, many humans that had contracted COVID. I did a webinar for Jeff um, a while back, um, and it was about an epidemic of fear. And interestingly enough, Nux vomica is also highest grade remedy for fear of disease in Benninghausen's repertory. It's the only one in that high grade. So I thought that was interesting because I, a lot of that, you know, you know, a lot of that is happening with COVID. People, a lot of folks are petrified with fear of COVID. So that may be one of the reasons Nux is also the best remedy early on. I'm not sure, but it's interesting. And um, Will Falconer also posted this after he recovered from COVID. One of his most useful therapies was to watch YouTube videos of comedies, you know, stand-ups or Three Stooges or anything that would make him laugh. And he said he just 
felt better in a short time. And I, I can vouch for that. I, I truly believe laughter is the best medicine. So cough, laugh, cough, laugh in that cycle. So, so we've gotten through that part. We've got an idea of genus epidemicus for this pandemic of parvo. So we're going to just briefly touch on a few cases here. Um, these are cases from my practice. Uh, the first one is Mia, a five-month-old female pit bull. She came into the clinic one day with vomiting and diarrhea, lethargy, no appetite for 48 hours. She had a SNAP positive parvo test, and that was all the money the client had. She really couldn't afford to leave Mia there for treatment due to financial concerns, so I opted to take her home. So I gave her one dose of Nux Vomica 10M in the room, and I sent a dropper bottle home of the same remedy to give as needed. And um, the next day, she called and reported that she improved after the first dose, began eating and drinking a few hours later, and didn't need more doses. And um, the amazing thing is that this isn't unusual in our experience. I mean, even if we hospitalized her and kept her, it might have made things worse because it would have stressed her, you know, added stress to the equation. But a lot of times with the first dose of remedy, whether it's Nuxvomic or some other remedy, their response is phenomenal and a lot of times they are barking and eating and drinking a few hours later so it's pretty amazing the next case is pudgy a five-month-old male beagle mix vomiting and diarrhea for 24 hours very foul smelling stool with blood and that was one thing about uh, mia she didn't have that foul smelling stool yet at all she was mainly just vomiting but pudgy did he had this cadaver odor of the stool which is which is a keynote symptom of, of arsenicum. And he was very restless in a cage. It's like he, he couldn't find a place to lay down. He just kept circling and trying to lay down. He couldn't get comfortable. Parvo test was strong positive. Had a little bit of dehydration, not too bad. We gave him arsenicum album 1M and started IV fluids. And then the next day, his uh, restlessness and diarrhea were better, but he was more nauseous. He was really drooling a lot, dry heaving, vomiting, refusing water. Um, so we gave Nux Vomica 10M because it seemed to fit that symptom picture a little better. And uh, nausea resolved over the next six to eight hours. Next morning, he ate and drank and went home in the afternoon with no symptoms. And then the last uh, last cases are a pair of uh, litter mate chihuahuas, four-month-old females, Pepper and Precious. They both, these were puppy wellness package puppies in August 2014. So this is before we were doing weekly no so dosing. Pepper got sick first on October 29th in the morning and tested positive. Uh, she got arsenicum album 10M, one dose, which matched her symptoms best. Began eating and drinking by the afternoon and went back home the same day with, with nothing else. Precious came in with slightly different symptoms on November 3rd, so about three or four days later. Mostly nausea and vomiting, no diarrhea, parvo positive. Worse condition than Pepper. Um, I gave Nux Vomica 10M and IV fluids, probably because of the presence of nausea and vomiting without diarrhea. And next day, his symptoms were more in the arsenicum state. She was restless with foul diarrhea with blood. So she got arsenicum album 10M, three doses total over the next three days. I think it was like one at night, two the next day, or one the next afternoon, one the next morning. So she held steady without deteriorating and finally improved quickly on the last day and went home. So her course was a little different than her sister's. <clears throat> so this is just a, a sample of uh, four different cases, but you can see they're all managed slightly differently depending on individual symptom pictures. Uh, the idea of individuality, though, applies to every homeopathic case, uh, but in parva treatment, we, we also have this idea of genus epidemicus to help narrow our remedy choices. We, and it can involve changing a remedy many times a day. Sometimes I'll change a remedy every hour. I mean, I just watched that puppy and if it looks like, no, this remedy is not helping, the symptoms have shifted now, I, I go with the symptoms as they are and I, I change the remedy, I just do it. And we base it on the response to symptoms. My, my techs uh, who, who help me, they, they've gotten so good that a lot of times they, they, know, they know which remedy to give. You know, they can tell. They say, you think we should give you know, phosphorus? Do you think we should give arsenicum? 
and they'll ask me first, but a lot of times they're right. You know, their their intuition about it is is very good. So, um, so with this idea of genus epidemicus, you know, you you can uh, you can still work the case up. You can analyze the case and do your graph and your analysis and read your materia medica, of course. But you've got a smaller group of remedies to choose from, and a lot of times you don't have a lot of time to, you know, pour over your choices as this pup's deteriorating rapidly in front of you. So um, my conclusion is that um, my conclusion is this was a very cold night of camping. It wasn't as comfortable <laughs> as it looks in, not as comfortable as it looks in the picture. <laughs> oh, anyway, that that was a nice picture my wife took. Picture was much better than the camping trip, though. Uh, anyway, natural immunity beats vaccination. I would say every time. And if anything has frustrated me during this whole COVID thing, it's having to endure all the media hype about a vaccine. A vaccine is coming. We got to have a vaccine. We can't do this without a vaccine. You know, it just it just makes me um, almost apoplectic. I can't I can't describe how frustrating it is. Um, because we know that we have the tools, you know, we we probably could have put a stop to this six months ago if we had distributed remedies. I don't know how you would do it through health department or somehow, but have people just take a sip of water with the remedy in it. But anyway, uh, that's my feeling. Natural immunity beats vaccination <clears throat> and nothing helps build natural immunity better than homeopathy. So it's superior in epidemic diseases. It's shown this over and over again throughout the last couple hundred years with all kinds of epidemic diseases from malaria to yellow fever to cholera, um, influenza, the big pandemic in 1918. So it's um, there's really no comparison. And a great everyday example we have right in front of us in our veterinary practice is parvo and dogs. You know, I would say it's still considered epidemic in dogs and possibly pandemic. So with, um, with homeopathy, we focus on establishing a high state of health and and resistance to disease by by beefing up the terrain, you know, making the animals stronger, making them more sturdy. By doing this, we have fewer susceptible individuals. And when you have fewer susceptible individuals, you have you can have less chronic disease, which equals a healthier world. So I think this is really true for all animals, four-legged and two-legged. And that is the end of my presentation. There's one question slide. There's one more. That's my favorite one. Huh. Mm. That was the constellation Gemini to the right of the moon. That happened this spring. One night we were sitting out and it was my mom's birthday and she happens to be Gemini. And we looked up and look, there it was. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that, that was a pretty nice evening. But um, anyway, um, oh. that's my talk. Thank you, Todd. That was awesome, awesome, awesome. I have a question, though. Yeah. When you mentioned uh, vaccines for rabies that we have to give, um, you mentioned that you'll only give it to a healthy pup. Uh, what What's your criteria for healthy? Um, well, I'm pretty picky, Jeff. I mean, if there's anything going on at all, I'll usually talk about postponing. You know, and well, with puppies coming in for their very first rabies, you know, if they have, if they have, if they're having itchy skin issues, ear problems, digestive issues, behavior issues, you know, anything, I think that would that would uh, disqualify them as being normal. We'll we'll usually talk about postponing it, just starting homeopathic treatment, and I'd say nine times out of ten, the 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 pet. Go Guardians are fine with it. You know, they they say, oh yeah, by all means, we we want to do that. You know, sometimes they're in a position where they really have to have the vaccine. Like they may they may live in a rental property situation. Their landlord has to see proof of vaccine, something like that. So if that's the case, we'll we'll go ahead and do it. But we probably will try homeopathic treatment at the same time. Yeah. Great. And what if, what if they're not having any overt issues, you know, just early, some late historic or early, sort of early warning signs? Yeah, well, um, what are early warning signs? 
Oh, you know, uh, just late, latent sore signs, you know, a little eye goop, red line, you know, doggy smell. Yeah. Think, things yeah. that. Um, discharges of different kinds. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Itchiness is a big one in our part of the country. We see a lot of, a lot of skin allergy symptoms. Um, and those a lot of times start up before they're a year old. Um, I've seen dog, I just saw a dog that had horrible ears and it wasn't a year old yet. And this, this dog already needed bilateral ear, rese ear resection, you know, total ear canal re removal, I mean. The, <laughs> the cartilage was all turned to bone already. <clears throat> yeah, I'd never seen anything like that in such a young dog. Yeah, was that, was so, that a co cocker spaniel? It was a cocker spaniel, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, yeah, other other latent signs of sore. You know, there. I mean, there are many things that could qualify as that. So usually it's just usually it's just some indication that they've got an imbalance showing. You know, they've got some kind of imbalance already. And, and you uh, sometimes it's pretty subtle. Sometimes the the people haven't even picked up on it. You know, they kind of accept it as normal. Like, oh, he, you know, he gets real stinky like once a week. We just give him a bath and then it goes away. <laughs> but then it comes back a few days later, but we give him a bath again. So, so that's normal, <laughs> right? And, you know, things that they just tend to sweep aside. What, what is the, what is the Indiana? I mean, do you have to go through the health department to do a waiver in Indiana or you can just write when, um, and, and that's it? Um, we, we just we just write one um and it it depends you know it depends on who's looking at the waiver as far as how much weight it carries the state vet's office has told me they they don't accept waiver instead of vaccination mm -hmm. they said but if it works for you know a boarding kennel or a grooming parlor or a training facility you know that's fine you know if you want to write a waiver and they cool. accept it that's fine cool. um because a lot of times the those those are the places that are really being the vaccine police, you know, the, the grooming and boarding and training places where the dogs congregate. So we we have gotten a lot of them to accept nosos instead of a vaccine for everything but rabies, but um, some of them won't. They they think the nosos are something I make up in my basement, I think, and they so they don't trust they don't trust it. And um, uh, even though I I give them information and things to read. You know, it's it's hard to convince people sometimes. All right, thank you. Any any other questions or comments, Henrietta, Sue, Judy? Looks like Laura's here. Actually, let me see if I can unmute everybody. Um, looks like Francie is unmuted. Ellis unmuted. James. Jeff, while you're oh. unmuting, uh, yep. Todd, do you go back and treat these, um, follow up with these animals and, and treat them with, with a, 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 another remedy after they've recovered? The parvo, parvo cases? Yeah, your parvo cases. Sorry. Um, we, we do sometimes. Um, honestly, sometimes we, we never see them again. Yeah. I, I've seen dogs that had parvo <laughs> several years ago, and they'll come in because they they might need something, you know, they might just need an L trim or something, and then we'll look back and say, oh, we haven't seen this dog since it had parvo four years ago, you know. And yeah. so we have that kind of thing. Um, I usually do have a conversation with them though about following up and the importance of, uh, you know, following up with homeopathy so we can we can go further and helping this dog with chronic disease. So, unfortunately, a lot of them may have the attitude that if it's not broken, don't fix it. You know, right. so they, they see a dog that looks fine to them, so. But yeah, it's a good question though. Um, everyone's unmuted, so just feel free to, to ask any questions. Well, I have some, I have a comment. This is Judy. Um, since I've opened my practice, 
the um, well where my practice is it's really a poor section of Augusta and I was seeing a lot of parvo I was accepting anybody as a client and um, like you the response to remedies was pretty good and these dogs were eating crap um, came from poor places, you know, it's, you know, pit bulls and stuff like that. Um, yeah. As time went on, um, I found at least in Maine that arsenicum is the, is my first go-to um, because mm -hmm. it's the one I've been most successful with. I had one dog that I switched from arsenicum to phosphorus. Interestingly, I've never used NUX um, or needed to. And oh. most of the, and most of these guys um, were treated as outpatients. Um, yeah. One had um, sub Q fluids. Um, the the one that took the longest to heal up was somebody who again was feeding kibble, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and that yeah. took maybe five days, but the rest were better in forty eight hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I pretty, I've often thought, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Todd. No, I, I was just going to say I've often thought of, um, you know, going going to not using no sods and using remedies instead. Like, like for instance, just giving them arsenic and let them take that um, as, a, as a preventative. And I don't know how I would do it. I mean, I, I don't know how I would space it apart, how I would time it. And I guess since the no sod uh, plan seems to be working pretty well at the moment. I don't really want to, I'm not eager to change it. Um, and I haven't really seen it cause problems. You know, I know there's some concern about um, triggering latent disease and things like that, but I, I haven't seen that really be much of an issue. So when I asked oh. Dr. Fiore about it, uh, Tim Fiore, I asked him about it. He's my homeopath and one of my kids was having a baby and they wanted to know about using nosodes for their baby. And, he said, well, he said, no, those are sexy, but, you know, we're better off just giving a constitutional <laughs> remedy. <laughs> so, yeah, I, like I said, okay, well, that's, that's interesting. So, it's interesting that you I'm, say I'm, that. So I'm doing, I'm doing sexy no sods, I guess. And, uh, <laughs> what I should title the talk. I've never heard a homeopathy titled uh, with called sexy before but that's good to... <laughs> <laughs> i know i think he meant it was like they were all the rage or they were popular yeah. right now in human on the human side you know homeoprophylaxis <laughs> so my my pennsylvania practice was um was uh had a really variety of clients you know some who couldn't find food or shelter and some who could you know buy the boat yeah. kind of thing and Mm -hmm. I, I didn't use, I didn't vaccinate, um, and I didn't use no sods in the way that you are, Todd. Um, I used them sort of in special situations when I had clients who were really, uh, really fearful about, about contagion, mm -hmm. or if I had mm -hmm. a pup that um, was not under constitutional care that might be going to some big dog show event or something like that. Right. And, and yeah. the parvo cases that I treated, uh, interestingly, most of them were in vaccinates. And mm -hmm. those those dogs for me uh, were kind of harder. They, were, they weren't the one or two doses and send them out the door kind of cases. They were, they were usually much, um, much tougher. Um, and and like Judy, uh, arsenicum and phosphorus were were the were the remedies that that I primarily used. Uh, once or mm -hmm. twice Nox, um, once or twice Carbovag, but but really, you know, arsenicum and phosphorus were the real workhorses for for mm -hmm. for me. Um, and yeah. and I, I think it's I think it's curious. I you know I don't know if it's a if it's a a strain thing um i you know you wouldn't think from the homeopathic standpoint it would be a strain thing with the virus uh, or mm -hmm. whether it was a relative health of the individuals or i i, I don't know you know or, yeah. or maybe 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 um you know it was that yeah well i mi i mix i missed the nox vomica cases because i just miss mixed missed them and we mm -hmm. know with some of these acute 
diseases that that if you get them close, but you're not 100% on, it's still enough to shift the vitality to, to, to in a positive yeah. direction. So I, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the thing about nosodes is that I um, used them again when I first opened my practice. And I had um, flare-ups of chronic disease. Uh, I can remember a golden retriever puppy would get the distemper nosode because she didn't want to vaccinate, but she was afraid of the disease and mm -hmm. whatever. And within a week, I had um, superficial pyoderma. And then huh. we treat it yeah. and would treat it with um, a constitutional or a chronic remedy. Mm -hmm. And I'd wait, then we would do parvo. And sure enough, within a week, not as severe as it was, um, but it flared up again. And again, I repeated the remedy. And I told her, we're not doing this. Um, because every time I give it, it triggers chronic um, symptoms. So, and that dog was never sick. Um, or I should say with parvo distemper or anything, and, and we've got everything in Maine. Um, yeah. So I kind of got away from the no-sode, but that yeah. being said, um, the point of in face of an epidemic, um, I think is very key. So my client, I haven't ever used um, um, kennel cough um, vaccines, and um, but I have used uh, the kennel cough no soap. And it doesn't matter what the upper respiratory flavor of the month is going on at the kennels. These, if they give it before they go, these dogs don't get sick. And the vaccine, as you pointed out, the mm -hmm. vaccines did. Um, one of my clients, mm -hmm. his dog would get parvo, but it's because he didn't give it anything, not even, or not parvo, but mm -hmm. kennel cough. Um, but he didn't even give the the no so that he had at home, uh -huh. and uh -huh. which God knows. So I told him he had to do it, or he's going to be coming here uh, a lot. And um, the woman working at that kennel um, pointed to the owner. She said, "Look, this dog is coughing. That dog's been vaccinated. Look at this dog is not vaccinated. This one had the no so and mm -hmm. um, the kennel person happened to have been a volunteer at my clinic so she mm -hmm. kind of knew the whole thing um the other nice. thing about lept the lepto that everyone's worried about we have it up here like everybody and i had a client who said that her front yard in the spring is a porcupine sewer so oh. Oh. so our plan there is to follow kind of what cuba did which is yeah. when there's stagnant water you give the no sode every other week. I mean, it's just a guess um, mm -hmm. for posology. And then when it dries, mm -hmm. you stop. So she's been mm -hmm. doing that now for a few years. And she did lose a dog to multiple, it had multiple kidney things. She was Lyme positive, she's lepto positive, and she mm -hmm. had a, um, a kidney infection. So that dog mm -hmm. was going to hell in a handbasket. She but was since then, yeah. 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 Wow. Interesting. I saw a lot of I saw a lot of um, uh, activation of chronic disease or reactivate worsening of non recognized chronic disease in the herds that I kind of inherited on the on the tail of some clinicians who really threw no soda around with heavy hands and mm -hmm. and uh, that was a uh, that was a some several interesting conversations, but I, I can remember one guy who was really vigilant. He was trying to do the best thing and was trying to get out ahead of everything and had a huge, huge, huge no so collection that he was using in his cattle herd. And, and he said to me, you know, Sue, I've been trying to do this for however many years. And he said, when I look at the health of my herd, I think it's gone down. This was at my first visit to his place you know i think mm -hmm. that it's gone down in the in the several years that i've been you know doing this approach and and mm -hmm. i you know i had to agree histor historically with with what he was telling me so you know we quit with that and started treating a little a little a uh, little differently i i i can't 
help but wonder though with those nosodes i think that on the source of them uh some of them were vaccine based nosodes rather than rather than product of disease no i mean they all get mm-hmm. lumped into into being called nosodes mm-hmm. uh even yeah. if they're not prepared right. and i think that's probably worth a, a, a discussion todd when we when we start mm-hmm. looking at the source of our supplies to make sure yeah. that they come from diseased animals uh, or diseased individuals rather than, um, you know, making up a, an, an, an isopathic pr- preparation. Oh, yes, I agree. Mm-hmm. Okay, any, you want comments. To, yeah, any, any other comments? Uh, Stephanie, I see you just got here. That's awesome. So, any um, anything from your end? Sorry, I don't know why I didn't I didn't get on the first time. I tried it again, and it just this time it took me to a different window. Okay. Any um, any any uh, homeoprophylaxis, to parvo, or vaccine comment? Oh, I'm gee, I'm so sorry I missed that. Um, because I missed the whole thing. I've been using the Parvo and Distemper no sods for my puppies. Um, and I'm curious if anybody listened to the lecture by Todd Cooney. And he's Todd um, just Todd that's, just spoke at it. Um, that's okay. me, me here. Oh great, great. So, so everyone here that. can say yes. <laughs> So you're mm-hmm. using the combo um, of the different no sods all together. Is that right? What's that? You're using the um, combo no sod, like distemper, parvo, adenovirus, all together? Yeah. Well, yeah, we didn't really go into that uh, detail specifically, but what, what I do right now is we, we give one dose of combo no sod and then we send home a bottle with just parvonosode, and we have them start in a week. We just give it weekly until they're six months old. So here's I have two and, questions. I have two questions for you. Yeah. One, um, apparently you're less concerned about distemper than you are about the parvo, but my experience is that distemper can affect adult dogs. So are you not seeing any distemper occur later on? That's one question. Yeah, not really seeing it later on. No, not much. So well, second question, um, I'm I'm getting dogs that are needing treatment um, before they're six months. Some of them are coming in. I'm already starting to treat them homeopathically. And so my experience has been, or most what I was taught, was that um, I, I'm not strengthening my patients with the no-sodes. So I'm using, if I if they need constitutional therapy, then I'm jumping in there with a homeopathic remedy and I'm not going to want to interfere with that with the no so Does anybody have a different understanding or a different experience? Personally, I, I agree, Stephanie, that that we're probably not strengthening um, them over in the long run with the no so And yeah, if I have a patient that will allow me to start treating uh, with an individualized remedy early, I will use the remedy and not use the no soap. Yep, me too, Stephanie. This is Judy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and this is Todd, and that's what I do too. I mean, if they need constitutional treatment, we we pause the no soap or just postpone it. We just go with constitutional. Okay, okay, yeah. good. Does anybody have different um, dosage schedule for their no-sodes? I've been using Richard's. I've used his protocol now ever since that, that course. So I start out with 30C and then I go to 200C. Yeah, top. we didn't talk about 2E, two, two send the, um, the potency scale, so do you keep them at 30 or 200 the whole time? I stay at 200, but they have it in liquid, so they succuss it before each dose. So in theory, it's a little more potent. It's yeah. the potency goes up a little bit with each time. So that's that's aggravation? what I've been doing. How about aggravations? Haven't haven't seen any aggravations really. Okay, I've seen a couple. 
mm -hmm. with my protocol. Um, and of course, then yeah. I mean, I've got to treat constitutional disease, but. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else from anyone? I, I would love to have an extended conversation about the, and it, not certainly this evening, but that whole question and fallacy about um, immunity and antibodies. And, and, you know, I mean, we can, we could talk about it about uh, which immunoglobulin are we, are we measuring or trying to stimulate arguably, but, but just that whole, that whole thing that everything is, is driven on right now that, that, mm -hmm. you know, we need to, that, that, that the presence of antibodies is equated to immunity uh, you know, without looking at the presence of antibodies, plus the, put the I mean, even even in even in the uh, conventional sense of the presence of antibodies, then a challenge, and then we can determine whether there there is immunity or not. Um, I think mm -hmm. it's a I think it's a a really big problem, and I I think it's a really big problem. You know, Todd, when you you talked earlier. But, you know about the the current situation with um, with the SARS uh, COVID two virus and 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 stuff and and looking at what is the relationship between um, between immunity and antibody formation. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, and I, I think what I took my information was from was Ron Schwartz. I think he did some of that research years ago. I wonder mm -hmm. if we can contact him. Yeah, Ron, Ron Schultz. Schultz. Schultz, yeah, or yeah, I mean, Schultz with, from Wisconsin, with, yeah, yeah, yeah. And my, you know, my question isn't mine. Is you know, I'm not doubting Ron's work or some of the work that that he and Gene Dodd did together, and and in situations where we have antibody formation, and then and then we've challenged, and you know, yeah, forget individual susceptibility and all of that sort of stuff for for this part of the conversation, but there's a lot of places that are just saying that antibody formation not just parvovirus but antibody formation um, in the face of desired disease that's been vaccinated um, you know is is indeed protective without without challenging mm -hmm. and how are they making that assertion also uh, that, that if I zero convert I'm protected and we don't know in, how, how, how how we we know. without a without a all we all we know that is if you zero convert you zero convert <laughs> that's right, all we know right, right, right. Yeah. exactly yeah, yeah and, well. and, and you know extend that to the presumption that if i inject you with something that you've zero converted mm. Mm. that's right because there are no vaccine non responders that's right i forgot <laughs> No, I, I've got a lot of good information from a, um, a little book called Vaccine Illusions by uh, immunologist Tatiana Obukonich. Tatiana Obukonich, her name's kind of hard to say, but um, really good information on there in uh, immunity in general. She's a PhD immunologist, kind of like Richard, only she's not a veterinarian, but um, she, she uh, I learned a lot from reading her little book. Very interesting. I'd recommend it to you guys. It's a, it's an ebook. I think I found it on Kindle, but, and she's on YouTube quite a bit too, doing little talks about immunology and vaccines. And since we're on she has a whole topic. chapter about immunity without the antibodies, immunity without antibodies. And Todd, Todd, would you send that link around to the list? That that would be great to have. Yeah, I'll send that out. That'd be awesome, great. And since we're talking about immunology and the terrain and vaccines and all that, um, another book I'd highly recommend is called Tending Adam's Garden. Talking about the, the Garden of Eden and where we went wrong and how the terrain and the brain and the immune system are the the definers of you know the individual and this is from a, a world-renowned md immunologist 
So that's also an awesome, awesome book. Oh yeah. Thanks for that, Joe. Sure. Yeah, well, um, I guess we'll send everything around to the VH list. So um, would everyone want to have that too? That's a great idea for November to have that discussion. But then we'd have maybe have a, a non, non homeopath speaker. But I guess we can talk about that further. Well, we don't have to do it this year. We can do it next year or another time. Or it's just, it's a, it's a totally misunderstood concept. Yeah. Yeah. If we can find somebody, then we'll just go with what their schedule is, and schedule it in, with, and according to their, their schedule. Well, I, you know, I think someone like Gene Dodds would be would be happy to talk about that with us. So. Huh? Any I else? just sent that out. I sent that link out. Oh, thank you, Todd. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. So, anything else from anyone you want to comment on or any questions? Todd, can I get your email address? I have us some questions about your lecture um, at AHVMA. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. It's a, um, it's a D R T C O O N E Y at gmail dot com. Thanks. Yep. All right, so I guess we will wrap it up. Todd, thanks so much for your time. Thanks to everyone yeah, for thanks coming. To everybody. And Ella and others say thank you as well. And we will see you next month for last uh, webinar, AVH webinar of this 2020 auspicious year. So thank you all. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Judy. And we will talk soon. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.